Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder. Uh, today, Ditech, the debt collector. A place that, uh, if you're in a foreclosure, they say that they're, they are a financial company. Well, they also apparently send letters that say that they're a debt collector. Which I think is quite interesting. I don't think you can be both. So, uh, well, what's that all about? And other discoveries. And uh, so it's been a really busy couple weeks. Um, found out stuff about the Selective Service system and how it differs from uh, being in the military. Right, They're two completely different systems. It doesn't look like anybody's being properly registered and classified. They may be registered, but they ain't been classified. Let me show you where that comes from. And another thing was... Uh, because these are going to have to be for a different video. I'm just going to get them out of the way. Another thing is, recently, I had gone down and filled out a Michigan change of address, voter registration. All right? And so, again, I'm going to do spend more time on this in the video. But first name is Robert Allen. Last name, at least, never have a middle name. All right? But if you look at the form, it says street and number. So I said, okay, I'm going to put that in, street and number. But what I did for the residence address is I didn't use the address where the house is that I'm living in. The residence address is actually your place of residence. Right? So if we were to look at, uh, this is out of the United Nations. The place of residence refers to a civil subdivision of a county, parentheses, district, county, municipality, province, department, state, in which the individual resides. So it's your place of residence, not your, you know, necessarily your house number. Well, my place of residence is Oakfield Township. And so I went to Oakfield Township's website, and I'm looking at it, I said, hey, Oakfield Township, here's their address. All right, 10300, 14 Mile Road, Rockford, Michigan, Rockford, MI, 49341, doesn't have a plus four. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to use that information and fill this form out. And uh, sign it. And so that was the residence address. And the, but then for my mailing address, I said, well, I want the mail to come to me. But it says street and number also. So, okay, I'll make that 14 Mile Road Northeast, 10955, which is, you know, basically my address. Well, this address here is the Township Hall, this 10300. My mailing address has a plus four, so I put it on there. Um, and the residence address, see, it adds one thing. It says county. So I didn't just put Kent. I put Kent County. So it couldn't be confused as County of Kent. I want everybody to know I'm in Kent County, not County of Kent. Kent County is the administrative arm of whatever the sovereign state of Michigan is supposed to be. And I don't know what the County of Kent is. I can't find anything that shows that it ever was created. Ah... Uh, are you a citizen of the United States of America? No. Will you be 18? Yes. And then I said, well, if you check no, you can't do C or D. Okay, well, there's C. Don't want to do it anyways. There's D. Don't want to do that anyways. Now it says sign at both X's for D. So, because as you see, well, here's an X, but then here's another X. But it also says voter registrations with an S. So it's like, okay, well, there's two registrations happening here. And uh, no matter which one you did of these registrations, you would have to sign here when you're done at the bottom. But this is not a voter registration. This is like an elector registration, in my opinion. I certify that I am a citizen of the United States. Yes, I am. I want to be, for those of you that are afraid of being a citizen of the United States, I'm afraid I don't agree with you. So I'm trying to be one. So I'm happy to be a citizen of the United States, but I don't want to be a citizen of the United States of America. That's King George's venue. Treaty of Peace, 1783. Just go read the first chapter. Paragraph, excuse me. Uh, anyway, so I did this, and uh, well, lo and behold, some days later, I get this in the mail. Robert Allen Retluski, one zero, you know, fourteen mile road backwards, one zero three hundred, which is the township hall. 
and you know the postman put this on there and put it in my mailbox. And when I opened it up, when I got a, when I did finally open it up, it had a change of address number on that has it for Tim Meyer Road 13100, uh, Rockford, Michigan, with the uh, five digit zip and then this date behind it. And that is, you know, on the label that goes here. So they changed it and sent it to me. Now, when I got it, you know, I mean, they didn't have to put it in my box, but they did. Because that, you know, they should have been, based on this, put it into the Oakfield Township Hall's box. But they didn't. They brought it to me. And I thought about that at first. Um, but because of this, I've signed up for all these things on the post office. You know, one of the things is you can see the mail that's coming into your box on a daily basis. So this was in my box, or it was in my email, saying that I was going to get this mail to me at you know, my address. Because the address they have on file is 10955 14 mile road. Unless it's somehow been changed also because of the Secretary of State. Well, this was my natural person, right? That's what I'm saying. That's me, physical person, me. But I also have an artificial person. And so this would be half of the definition of domicile, which one of the books I read way back when, when I got started in this, thank God, was that, you know, domicile was when you registered your natural and legal person in the same municipality. Well, I, to me, I had just registered my natural person in the municipality using the place of residence as the address. So, you know, the township hall doesn't know about this, but the state knows that I'm, you know, my place of residence now is the uh, Oakfield Township, and they they gave me proof of it to put onto my car. Very cool. I don't have a driver's license. I have a personal identification, you know, state ID. The other thing is, uh, and I'll show more of this in my next video, I have more time on this, is that they gave me a, a shortened... Um, PID number. It's the same number, but the last two digits are no longer in the number. That was on a different email or a different mail that I got. Um, but then I took the same idea and I went to the state um, Department of Treasury for the state of Michigan where I had a license, I have a license with the state for my business, Robert Allen Ritlinski. So I changed the legal address to the same thing, and the next day I got some mail. And that part I'm going to save for the next video. So, yeah, there's, you know, this is uh, all things that were just happening regardless of anybody's court case, which is really what this video is going to be about. Getting back to why we're here, Ditech the Debt Collector, 2018 CV 000136 is one court case, we'll see, and that's in Rock Co uh, County Circuit Court, Rock County, Wisconsin. That versus 18 CV 136, which is another, another number that they're using, which is at Circuit Court Branch 7. Place unknown. I don't know where they're from. Right? They're not Rock County, Wisconsin. Uh... I believe they're out of the city of London. But they're not the government. They're just pretending to be. You know, it's a private court. Maybe it's a tribal court. Maybe it's an ecclesiastic court. Maybe it's whatever it is that they believe they have us in and they have control over us. And so they, you know, they're not taking us to the state court. We're going to a local court pretending to be the state court. Or they lie, cheat, and steal. And uh, because we're not properly... Uh, rebutting those presumptions, things aren't going our way. So, today's Tuesday, the 14th of August, 2018. And it, according to the post office, that's the proper way to do your address on your cancel stamp. We'll be talking more about that also tomorrow. Uh, Rob Ryder's email address. Hey, that's me, Rob Ryder. Right? Uh, that's my avatar. You court of record at AOL.com. Phone number 616-712-6179. And hey, I got a new way for you to donate, if you would, please. That's PayPal money request. 
basically, I need from you an amount in your email address. So if you sent me an email with the amount you were willing to donate, I could send you through PayPal using your email address a request for money, which you could use a credit card for. If that would make it easier. PayPal account, though, is Rob Ryder at AOL.com. They use your, you know, an email address for your account. Or there's always uh, the mail, Robert Allen Rutluski. Right? My, I don't want to play with my email or my mailing address yet. So 10955 14 Mile Road Northeast, Rockford, Michigan, 49341-8664. Because, again, it showed on this thing here, right, that uh, according to the state of Michigan, or Michigan, this doesn't say state of Michigan, Michigan, change of address, voter registration, that your residence address and your mailing address both start with the street and have the number second. Street and number, not number and street. Residence has a county. Put in Kent County, not county of Kent. Uh, you know, your name is uh, Robert Allen. It's my first name. It's my given name and last name. Very cool stuff that uh, I hope, you know, can give us all some remedy sometime, and that's what I'm looking for. Now, another thing that... I guess I'm going to play these right now. That came up was... Um, Bob in Arizona had done a lot of research on... Selective Service Act. And uh, so he, in fact, he followed up and went to the Selective Service Act site, or Selective Service System site, and got a copy of the Selective Service Registration, and yada, yada, yada. But we were looking at this act that started the Selective Service Act, which is, you know, for the draft. So the first thing is, it isn't the Volunteer Army. No, this is for the draft. The Volunteer Army has nothing to do with this. They're two totally different systems. The Selective Service System, I can't remember what they call it, if it's an agency or whatever, right? It's an independent agency. It has nothing to do with any other agency of the government. It has its own records. And it's the one that says if you're properly registered and classified or not. So in this act, it's very plainly written. It doesn't take very many parts to find, and I'll spend more time on this in the video tomorrow. But it says in Section 454, Provided that each registrant shall, shall, shall be immediately liable. When? Immediately. What? Liable for classification and examination. And what? Shall, as soon as practicable, following his registration, be so classified and examined. Both physically and mentally in order to determine his availability for induction for training and service in the armed forces. Now. If they're following this act, then you need to be classified and examined if you're registering for the draft, which everybody is registered for the draft, I believe. I know at least all able-bodied men are. And a lot of times it's by the Secretary of State from your state. You don't really have anything to do with it. They just, you know, check a box, we'll do it for you. But it's the rest of it. Classification. Well, let's go on. The next section in 454 said manner of selection of men for training and service. Quotas. Now, men, males and females, are men. That in the classification of registrants within the jurisdiction of any local board, the registrants of any particular registration may be classified in the manner prescribed by and in accordance with the rules and regulations prescribed by the president before, together, with, or after registrants, registrants of other prior registration or registrations. In other words, when we all catch on, we can all get classified at the same time, even if I registered 20 years ago. And you register tomorrow. We neither of us have been classified. We all need to be classified. We can all have it done at the same time. There's no particular order. You don't need to wait for me to be classified if you can go get it done. That's the point. We need to get it done. So who does it? Well, they have these things called local boards, as we find out. They're supposed to do it. And Bob was doing some research just today and said he was told they're at the mostly county level, but they've yet to give us any names. 
and they're not doing any classifications. When you start talking to people about this, they say, yeah, that's for the draft. It is. Yes, it's for the draft. And it's a duty for every able-bodied man in the United States to register for the draft. And since you're registering for the draft, well, they need to be classified. If you volunteer for the Army, that's totally separate from this. This is still a duty. So even people that have served in the military aren't classified for the draft, even though they may have registered. Go figure. Deferments and exceptions from training and service. There shall be posted. Where? Shall, or what shall? Shall, shall, shall be posted in a conspicuous pace, place of the office of each local board, a list setting forth the names and what classifications of those persons who have been classified by such board. Well, where are they doing this at? Because I never seen them. I served eight years in the Army. I, I don't know anybody who's ever been classified. General. That's why I told him. General. So I sent this to a general yesterday. And I'll leave his name out. And I'm going to give the military a few days to work on it. Because, well, I want to give him the time. But I'm going to use names next time I put it out. General, I know of no one that has been classified and examined by local boards. Do you? Right, this is making everybody in the military or everybody in the United States have a civil defect because you didn't file the frickin' law and get registered and classified in the United States. And what this would do then is this is how you would be found residing in a federal judicial district. And because you were, well, now the laws of the United States would apply. Because what they're doing now is they're not allowing us to appear in the United States. They're taking us to these improper venues. Which is exactly what was happening in uh, Terry's court case. Where, um, you know, she thinks she's going to 2018 CV 000136 Rock County Circuit Court. Rock County, Wisconsin. But the paperwork is saying 18 CV 136 Circuit Court, Branch 7. It doesn't really say where it's from. All right, this would be a court of the state, Rock County Circuit Court. And this one isn't, Circuit Court, Branch 7. It's just, you know, Judge Judy has got a uh, franchise. These are all franchise judges that are, they're judging in maybe courts of justice, but they're not judging in courts of law and equity. They may be judging in courts of equity, but they're not judging in courts of law and equity because that's the venue of the United States under Article 3. You know, so for the United States laws to exist, you need to be in a court that's a court of law and equity. And uh, it needs to be a court of the United States. And for that to exist and have any jurisdiction, you need to be found in the United States. And there are... Un you know, they are purposely not letting us be found in the United States. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, Terry's um, transcript here. But again, if you can, hey, take a minute, send me an email. Let me know if you can uh, donate, because I can't make my rent. It's the middle of the month. I really want to work on this. I don't want to have to go try to make a dollar, right? So I'm going to ask you to give me one instead. Please do. Okay, give me just a second to get my things in a row. Alrighty now then, so let's just tick a few things off the box to start with, right? This is the Wisconsin Circuit Court Access website, which uh, anybody can find. And if you were to put in this Rock County case number, you could find this case, right? But there it is, Rock County case number 2018-CV-000136, Ditech Financial LLC versus Terry L. Wilson at L. And uh, I've done a couple of videos on this here recently. Um, and so one was they were going to have a hearing last time we were doing this. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting. Ah, that was just put in since last time I looked. Wow, that's cool. So this is what happened on 
3, 2018, which was a Friday, not too long ago, where they have both a court official, or judicial official, I think, and a recorder listed. And they called defendant Terry L. Wilson in court, attorney William Nicholas Forshag in court for plaintiff Ditech Financial LLC. Attorney Forshag addresses the court regarding the filings, the frivolous filings. Terry Wilson's address is the court regarding claims. Court grants judgment of foreclosure with six months redemption and deficiency judgment in the amount of something. Right to appeal stated on the record. Court expunges filings on 528-629. And those were the UCC filings we'd put in. Well, that's what they said then. And then uh, on 8-7, they said court orders Wisconsin Department a uh, financial institution shall fully expunge Terry Wilson's financial statement filed those dates from its official records. Well, Terry Wilson didn't file anything on those dates. And so even today, if we went and looked at uh, the UCC filing, um, here's one of them that was put in on 528 that made the state of Wisconsin, Gray and Associates LLP, and the Judiciary Court State of Wisconsin, made them all debtors. It says it's still active. It says uh, filing history, none. Original filing only. Nothing has happened with that one. Well, since that court case had things added, let me update this real quick. No, still the same. And, uh, well, let's look at one more. Make sure we all go back here. Click on that. Make sure that that's yeah, still active. Nope. Original filing only. Okay. Put in a new search, which is the other number, which would be uh, filing number 2018. 18-0-0-0-9-0-2-5-9-5-9-2-5. Okay, uh, 629, initial financing, active. Terminated filings appear active until they expire. See the filing history below for any amendments to this filing. Okay, so if something was added to terminate it, it would still show active, but there would be something added to the filing history. Nothing's been added. So it doesn't appear that the uh, Wisconsin Department of Financing Institutions is paying any attention to uh, McElroy, comma, Barbara, Barbara W., then an order of judgment, uh, yada, yada, the transcript. Oh, so this is what happened yesterday. So Terry finally got this. Now, Terry's a truck driver. She wasn't home all the time. But she was home on the day that this came in. No, she wasn't not home. But when it was done, today's the 14th, right? I think this just all happened yesterday. Yeah, 14th. She got it yesterday. And so I said, well, call the... Uh, the recorder that recorded it, and tell her to go put it in your court case. And she did. Claire and Jennifer L. is the recorder. The court reporter, she put it in. And now these other things have been added that I don't know what those are. Uh, affidavit of mailing, notice of entry of judgment, cover letter for notice of entry of judgment, and affidavit of mailing filed. Because she hasn't gotten anything for the judgment yet. But maybe that's what's coming. But nevertheless, this got filed into this court case. So now let's go, let's kind of set the scene of the things that have happened so far, but it gets even better. I just got to remember where I put the damn thing. Okay, so back on, uh, when was this? God, what date was it? 5-31-2018, Clerk of Circuit Court, Rock County, Wisconsin, 
2018 CV 000136, right? That one. Notice the hearing, Ditech Financial LLC versus Terry L. Wilson, et al. Yeah, that all matches what's on the website that we were just looking at. And that's when, this was right after we had put in our first UCC filing. And the judge schedules this motion hearing for 8-3-2018, which was the Friday I'm talking about. Courtroom D, fourth floor, north courtroom. 51 South Main Street, Janesville, Wisconsin, 53545. And what's there? Well, it's the Rock County Circuit Court. Right, that's who's sending this out. Date, May 31st, 2018. So the Rock County Circuit Court, is saying that there's a notice of hearing for a hearing to be in courtroom D, fourth floor, north courtroom. Okay, so when that day comes, Terry goes up to the fourth floor, and there's nobody up there. It's pretty much empty. And she's looking around and finds a courtroom and uh, looks inside. The lights are all off. You know, looks at her paperwork, looks at the door, and somebody walks up and says, uh, can I help you? Turns out it was an attorney. He said, say, I was supposed to have court here today. He says, oh. He said, well, I, I believe they moved all the court cases downstairs today. And Terry's saying, well, that's what my paper says. Da, 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 da. And then somebody else walks up. Uh, a guy of color wearing a shirt that we would think is a uniform shirt, but it doesn't have any badges or patches on it. So if you, you know, maybe envision a sheriff's shirt, without any badges or patches, just the look of the shirt. And uh, says, uh, you know, I overheard your guys' conversation. Yeah, they've moved all the cases downstairs. Come out, I'll take you down there. Right? So they walk. she walks down to the second floor where these court cases are supposed to be and goes into a courtroom. That isn't what was on the paperwork, right? Because, again, where did the judge say to be? Courtroom D, fourth floor, north courtroom. What happens if you don't show up to court? You get default judgments. All right, so she didn't go into the room where she was supposed to. And I'm not blaming Terry. I'm just saying this is what this is the sting that's going on in the court. And so they sent her downstairs to the second floor, where it's no longer 2018 CV 00136. Now it's 18 CV. 136, in state of Wisconsin, Branch 7, Circuit Court, Rock County. Well, that ain't the same thing. But here they're saying it's Ditech Financial LLC, plaintiff versus Terry L. Wilson, at L, defendant. Motion hearing, uh, Circuit Court, where is it at? Circuit Court, Branch 7. Not Rock County Circuit Court. Not Rock County, uh, Wisconsin. And who's here? Well, you got appearances by William Fulche, attorney at law. That's not his full legal name. And Terry Wilson. That's not her full legal name. But that's what was on there, and they called her a defendant. And I crossed that out because, right, we're not going there as a defendant, right? That was the plan going in. Well, you're not going as the defendant, Terry. I'll write you something, and you're going there as a witness to a crime. So you're going to have your say in court, tell him to arrest the William Fauche. That's the plan. Let's see what happens. And Jennifer, hey, she's our court reporter that did put paperwork into the court today. Good for you, Jennifer. We may be calling on you as a witness. So this is the transcript of the proceedings, the court. All right. There is Ditech Financial LLC versus Terry Wilson. Now the judicial assistant speaks. Do you want the guardianship file? Let's just stop for a second. What does that mean? Who's the judicial assistant? And what about a guardianship file? Why is there a guardianship file in a frickin' foreclosure for a mortgage? Questions to be answered. Well, and because the recorders, the one that called this person the judicial assistant, they have to know who it is, so they're going to help us get this guardianship file. But 
At the time, that's what was said. The court. Just a second. And then uh, apparently, now it doesn't say the court said this, right? But case number 18 CV 136. Who said that? Apparently it's the judge, right? Because the judge is the court. So let's just look at it. Just a second. Case number 18 CV 132. Just wait for a second. I've got it. I got enough here. I don't need it. What was all that about? I say it's evidence that they're saying that Terry agreed that she's an 18 CV 136, not 2018 CV 00136. That's all they need, right? Hey, we told you what court you were in. You didn't rebut it. Judicial assistant, okay. Court, sorry about that. Okay, you are Terry Wilson. Ms. Wilson, I am. Well, no, she isn't. She should have said, no, I'm Terry Lynn Wilson. Right? I'm here as a witness to a crime. I started reading her stuff. Forgetting that anything they wanted to do, tell them who you are and start talking. And if they don't stop you, keep talking. If they say you're going to go, if they're going to find you in contempt, keep talking. Right? Get your say done. That's how I do it. But, okay. You are Terry Wilson. Yes, I am. Well, Terry, you're not. That's okay. The court, Terry Wilson is appearing in person. Right? If we had said Terry Lynn Wilson, then the court would have to say Terry Lynn Wilson is appearing in person. Which is her full legal name. First name, middle name, last name, no initials, no nicknames. Right? 6 CFR Code of Federal Regulations. 6 CFR Part 37. The Real ID Act or whatever it is, which has to do with identification and that you need to use your full legal name and defines your full legal name and says it's your first name, your middle name, your last name, no initials, no nicknames, which is the most important part. Because in court, all these people are using middle initial names for the most part. Today they didn't, but if we went back and looked at the paperwork, there'd be middle initial names all over this stuff. But now we're going to call him Mr. Foshag, right? Um, and the other appearance is Mr. Foshag. Good morning, Your Honor. William Foshag. It's F-O-S-H-A-G. From Gray and Associates. Appears for DITEC. Not DITEC Financial LLC. Right? Not just, you know, common blah, blah, blah. All right, Mr. Foshag, we're here on your motion for summary judgment. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, Terry should have appealed, said, no, we're here because I put in a UCC filing, and you called for a hearing, Judge. Right? And I've asked uh, that we have a summary, or a, what was it? A trial on merits. That's why we're here. Isn't it? But, you know, this is how you find out. This, this we're, we're reading... This is an act, and people upstairs were actors get to get Terry downstairs in the wrong court where these other actors will now do their part. But it's all an act. You're not in a state court. Okay, so I'm going to hear from you first, and then I'll hear from you, Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Your Honor. The plaintiff has filed this complaint in this case seeking a deficiency. What were they looking for? A deficiency. We need to see what that means, because they're not looking for foreclosure. They're looking for a deficiency. The property is owner-occupied. Thank you very much. They just said the owner is occupying the property. So if we had been saying Terry Lynn Wilson, well, they'd have to agree she was the owner. However, the loan was executed after April of 2016. What loan? So the redemption period here would be six months, even if the deficiency. Right? So six months redemption period. Service is proper. That is on file with the court. We did receive what is construed to be an answer from Ms. Wilson. Pay attention now. We did receive what is construed to be an answer from Ms. Wilson. It is more of a letter disputing the default and making some allegations. We have filed this motion for summary judgment supported by affidavit of DITEC. Let's stop there. If DITEC is going to send an affidavit and it has an out-of-state notary, then it has to have with it a certificate of authority from the Secretary of State of the state of the notary or it has no value in Wisconsin. 
an out-of-state notary can't just send their bare certificate. It needs to be authenticated that they were a notary. It's called a certificate of authentication. So, something to look at. Setting forth the default on the loan obligation. The debt was accelerated on the loan obligation. The debt was accelerated, setting forth the total amount due to the plaintiff at this time at 163000 and change. Again, the plaintiff is seeking a deficiency. That would be a six-month period of redemption. So who is uh, Ditech slash whoever trying to recover for? Right. Well, I showed in my last video that the attorney firm that was doing all the foreclosures um, process in a non-judicial state was doing it for the name uh, as attorney in fact for the person that uh, they were try trying to kick out of the house. You know, for the plaintiff or for the defendant, basically. You'd have to watch the video, but let's say it was me and my middle initial. Well, that's who they would say that they were the attorney in fact for. Attorney in fact for Robert A. Rutluski. Robert A. Rutluski is being sued, and Robert A. Rutluski is the attorney, is being represented by the attorney in fact that's doing the foreclosure. So they're foreclosing for me. They're, you know, I, I don't want them to foreclose, right? But that's what that would mean. That uh, There's something going on about this thing with the deficiency, it not, has nothing to do with uh, foreclosure on the mortgage. I'm going to say it has to do with the fact that attorney fees haven't been paid or something like that for the closing. Or the $10 hasn't been transferred to transfer the title. Right, that's the deficiency. They're going to claim this amount of money because, you know, that's what's on the paper and we don't know any better, but the deficiency is ten dollars. I don't really know, just my guess. So throughout the course of this case, we received several bizarre filings from Miss Olson. One of which was a UCC lien, which was filed against my firm and apparently also the state of Wisconsin and its courts. We also asked your honor and had presented an order for the court's review and approval to have that to direct the Department of Financial Institutions to expunge the UCC filings from the record. It's frivolous and filed in bad faith. The other filing that we received have run the gamut of some things that were typically to do with, we typically do see in a foreclosure. It's a difficult situation. There's no d doubt about that. We see often that, unfortunately, folks that get in a situation like this might resort to measures that they feel will erase the debt, eliminate the debt, go after the attorneys, go after the courts that are pursuing the foreclosure of the, on the default, on the loan obligation. And those are obviously all inappropriate and not bearing on the plaintiff's motion. All right, so all the things that she was complaining about didn't have a thing to do with what the, the plaintiff's motion was, I guess, the same. Um, there's no affidavit filed in opposition as would be required. The, the plaintiff is entitled to a judgment of foreclosure as a matter of law. So forgetting everything else the guy just said, there's no affidavit filed in opposition as would be required. And the plaintiff is entitled to a judgment of foreclosure as a matter of law. And this has to do with the fact that the answer that Terry gave, which we'll see they're saying was something she did back in February, subrogation and so forth, none of that was covering the things that they were talking about in their complaint. You know, her answer didn't answer the freaking complaint. Okay, all right. Ms. Wilson, I know that you have filed a number of things. The first issue has to do with the letter. I'm going to take it as an answer that you filed in February of 2018, shortly after you were served, indicating that you had equitable claims involving your name against DITEC, requesting a right of subrogation, including property taxes and the like. So that 
provided, but in that, you really didn't indicate anything as it related to whether or not there was a valid mortgage and lien and whether or not you were in default. No, she didn't do that in February. She did it on a UCC filing in May and then um, revoked the deed of trust in uh, July, into June. But she didn't do it at the beginning in her answer. And they're taking her answer to be this letter from February. Okay, but good for Terry. Uh, there is none, and I object to everything he just said. And she started reading hers. Outstanding. I am Terry Lynn Wilson. I am a resident of the United States and a witness to a crime against the Constitution and laws of the United States. This just got entered into a court case by the court recorder. Beautiful. The plaintiff, its attorney, Gray and Associates, LLP, and other conspirators have offended the United States by acts of treason and fraud, unlawfully converting rights, titles, and interests in my private property to use of others. I have docketed my, should be separated, my self-authenticated evidence, that would be Federal Rules of Evidence, Rule 902, of these crimes in case number 2018 CB, she didn't put it, all the zeros in, 000136, and move this court for a trial on merits and relief. Outstanding. Good, good job, Jerry. That's beautiful. The court. Okay. They just agreed. So at least in you know, 2018 CB 00136, the courts agreed. But that isn't where we are right now, right? We're simulating being there and we're in the Southern Court. But the courts agreed to that. Well, now we just filed this thing today into 2018 CV 000136. So I'm really interested to see what happens next. Well, I have to keep going. Ms. Wilson, I have the paperwork right here. We're Rob Ryder. Rob Ryder, Rob Ryder. They didn't even use my full legal name. Although the attorney did put in a motion that had Robert Allen Rutluski in it, I made it into a court case. Contacted the bar on June 14th and asked for the registration of Gray and Associates and this is the paperwork that I have. So I filed the motion of sanctions against him. Remedial sanctions. If you need a, not against me, against the attorney. If you need a copy of that, I have it right here. There are no signatures on their paperwork. Hey, let's take a look at that. Let me see if I can find it real quick. What would that have been on? That would be in State Bar, Wisconsin, right? So this is what I had done. If you didn't see this in my last video. Um, if a attorneys want to do business as an attorney firm and say that it's the attorney, then Gray & Associates LLP, being the business, has to register with the State Bar of Wisconsin. That's the law, Okay. So I said, okay, well, I want a copy of this registration from the State Bar of Wisconsin. And I'd asked for it like on a Saturday, but on Monday, within, you know, 15 minutes of them opening, this, whoever the person was working there had sent me this. And it's to Duncan C. Deli, which is uh, Gray and Associates LLP. You know, he's the, he's actually the, uh, the one to be served legal process. Uh, Attorney Deli, this letter is to remind you of important legal requirement of your firm, which our records list as a registered limited liability practice, limited liability company, or service corporation. So they don't really have them listed as any one. They never really check because they can't say which one they are. But they would have to be one of these. They can't be all three. Law firms, as well as lawyers practicing in Wisconsin, must renew their registrations annually with the state bar with Wisconsin. So... Not just the attorney, but the freaking business. And as we'll see, they're going to be talking about the attorney all the time from here on out and not about the business. We tried to make the renewal process as simple and as convenient as possible. Renewing your firm's registration requires three things. Completion and submission of the enclosed registration. A registration fee of $40. Show me the re return or the ticket. Show me the receipt, basically. Proof of adequate malpractice insurance. Okay, where's the proof of malpractice insurance? Outstanding. Because we can go tap their insurance policy. 
That's all good, right? But uh, to satisfy your requirement for free, please submit either a current certificate of insurance or a binder page indicating your level of malpractice insurance coverage. That's really what we should be asking for. Show me the binder, right? Show me the certificate of insurance or you ain't registered. Well, that's the letter. And then they sent the thing they're supposed to do. Da-da-da-da-da, uh, right? And so all of these attorneys are supposed to have their state or jurisdiction where it licensed listed and their nat nature of ownership interest listed. And none of them do. And it's not signed. It's not dated. So we put that in and say, hey, these people are in contempt of court because, you know, this is the Supreme Court's rules. They run the State Bar of Wisconsin. And there's a Supreme Court rule that says they have to do these things. They didn't do it. They're in contempt of court. We, we're we're going to put in a motion for remedial sanctions. Right? That's all in the last video I did. But that's what that was all about. So here we are now, right, in the hearing, going through a transcript. Terry said it didn't take very long, and it's only 12 pages, so, you know, they didn't, they weren't there very long. Okay, so, uh, what did Ms. Wilson said? I have the paperwork right here, where Rob Ryder contacted Barr on June 14th and asked for registration at Gray & Associates, and this is the paperwork that I have. So I filed a motion of sanctions against him, remedial sanctions against the attorney. If you need a copy of that, I have it right here. There are no signatures on their paperwork. I called after the date that I had filed this, and they wouldn't give me any more information. Therefore, he is in contempt of court of the Supreme Court rulings. They don't have a registration to operate, to work. And I have a CDL. Terry's a truck driver. And I drive down the interstate. And if I don't have the, that credential... That police officer will arrest me and get me out of that truck. So therefore, him being in contempt of court, I would like to have him arrested. Good for you, Terry. This has all been put in the court case now. Witnessed. The court. Are, are you trying to indicate that Mr. Forshag does not have a right to practice law in the state of Wisconsin? Before we see what she said, well, that really isn't the right question, right? What we're saying is that the attorney firm doesn't have the right to practice law in the state of Wisconsin. Because it's the attorney firm that needs to be registered as well as the attorney. Ms. Wilson, I'm saying the registration expired June 30th of this year. Good for you, right? No, I'm not talking about Mr. Forshag, unless you didn't say it exactly. No, I'm not talking about the man. I'm talking about the business. The business isn't registered. I have the paperwork. Do you want to see the paperwork? The court. What you're saying is they don't, this is Terry now. Good for you, Terry. Finish your sentence. They don't have registration to work in the United States. It's against the Supreme Court rulings in the state of Wisconsin. Excuse me. The court, Mr. Forshag, are you currently licensed to practice law in the state of Wisconsin? Again, she wants to make it about him. We want to make it about the business. Mr. Forshag, yes, Your Honor. The court, and is your license in good standing? Mr. Forshag, yes, it is. May I see proof of that, please? This is Terry talking. And the date that they paid for it? As of Monday, the court, no. Right? May I see proof of that, please? And the date that they paid for it? No. Stop. But the first answer is the answer. No, you can't see it. It didn't happen. Ma'am, just stop for a second. That's the judge speaking to Terry. All right. I have here from the State Bar of Wisconsin website, which is the organization that is responsible for making sure the lawyers are duly licensed to practice in the state of Wisconsin, is where it's reported. But again, we're interested in the business. Not that we're not interested in the attorneys, but we are interested in the business in this particular case. But they want to make it about the lawyer. 
that Mr. Forshag is in good standing, meaning he has met all the requirements as it relates to payment of fees, compliance with continuing legal education. Uh, he is also an active member of the State Bar of Wisconsin. So Mr. Forshag is appropriately here in front of this court. What court, though? Because we're not in the circuit court. We're in, uh, well, a district court of some kind but not in the circuit court of the state of Wisconsin. You know, the thing created by the Constitution. In terms of this matter, it is... That was the judge still talking. Ms. Wilson, I object. Well, ma'am, says the court. Ms. Wilson, as far as the date, ma'am, Ms. Wilson, of the 16th, Monday the 16th, he wasn't. So if he went in after that and paid his way, I get it. The court, well... Ms. Wilson, but prior to that, it was expired. The court, I will also explain to you that I see lists continuously of those lawyers that are no longer active and allowed to practice law. Again, we're talking about the lawyers, not the business. Good for you, Terry. Hey, that's none of my business. This is my business. <laughs> Good for you. The court, well, I have never seen Mr. Forshag's name on that list is what I'm explaining to you. Ms. Fort, Ms. Wilson, it's right here. I don't know what she was pointing at. The court, okay. What I'm going to do at this point is, this matter is before the court on the request for summary judgment. So what court did whoever ask for summary judgment under? 2018 CV 000136 or 18 CV 136. I believe it's going to be 18 CV 136. The answer that was filed, now she's talking about the thing in 2000, or in February, right? Not the things that we did afterwards. Because, you know, one of the things we did is we put in a non-UCC, which is still registered with the state. It hasn't been removed like they said they were going to. On which it says that, uh, you know, we had uh, claimed Terry L. Wilson, comma, an unmarried woman, as a fictitious name on a fictitious name filing in Wisconsin. It's called a firm name filing. And filed that into the court case. So now Terry is the name, right, that's on the deed of trust. And now she's saying she's revoking the deed of trust. This was all in the UCC because it was done in fraud. Blah, 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 blah. It's all in the last video. That isn't what they're using. As her answer, right? They're using this thing that she put in back in February, talking about subrogation. Nevertheless, I object, I appeal. Uh, let me go back. So, the answer that was filed, that'd be the thing in February. I object, I appeal. Good. Always appeal, not just object. Right? I appeal your answer. Go get, you know, go get your boss, because these people aren't the boss. Who, who do they work for? I want your boss to say what you said is okay, because I don't agree with it. I appeal your freaking, your decision, which is the words that came out of her mouth. When she decided to say this, well, I appeal. The court, in this matter, did not provide any sort of factual basis upon which, or any facts or, or issues of fact at issue at this point as it relates to this matter. So the thing in February didn't, answer the things that needed to be answered. Which the judge said earlier was the fact that it was a fraudulent... Uh, what did the... Did we have to go back up? I hope I can find it again. Uh, you really didn't indicate anything that it related to whether or not there was a valid mortgage, which is what we did on the non-UCC filing and lien, and whether or not you were in default. The other thing is, if there's a lien on your mortgage, they have to have filed a UCC filing. That's how you perfect a lien, is with a UCC filing. Right? If you're making a list of things to know, well, that'd be another one to keep in mind. Because someday we'll figure out how to put all these together and make them stop. But until then, we're making them talk. Which, this is shit they wouldn't have had to said before. Uh, so, 
in this matter did not provide any sort of factual basis upon which or any facts or issue or fact at issue. See, these are all like terms of law, right? Fact at issue, you know, has a definition. Facts or issues are two different things that have definitions. But then there's one that's fact at issue that has a definition. At this point, as at what point? Well, in February, as it relates to this matter. No, but let's talk about today. Ms. Wilson, I object, I appeal. The court. The complaint states a basis upon which relief can be granted. And based upon that, at which, at this point, since there are no issues of fact or law at issue, and no factual issues, it will be if we can ever get our paperwork into the proper court, that all that stuff is there, because we got state records that are foolproof evidence. But in this court, there may not be any, because we're in 18 CV 136. It is appropriate to enter the judgment of foreclosure of the, on the summary judgment request. This will be entered in the amount of 163000 Ms. Wilson, I object. I appeal. The court finishes the number. I will allow deficiency to be sought in sec a six-month redemption period as the loan in this matter was entered after it was entered after June of 2016. That's what you said, Mr. Forshag. Uh, April, April of 2016. I have to go back and see when it when Terry actually did the mortgage. I don't know what month she did it in, but they're saying you know after April. So maybe she did it in February. So then we're not talking the same mortgage. Ma'am, you have a right to an appeal. Ms. Wilson, I do. Court well. Ms. Wilson. And these UCCs have gone, and I'm going to. Ms. Wilson, unrebutted. That stands in law. The court. The other issue, ma'am, is you have the right to an appeal. When you get a copy of the judgment, when you get a copy of the judgment, when you get a copy of the judgment, where's the judgment? It will. You do have a right to an appeal, and you can do that. That is with the appellate court and the state of Wisconsin. Well, I'm going to say that's the 2018 CV000136 case. That's the appeal case. Maybe that's what that guardianship file is about. Right? That's the bigger court, the guardian of the little court, and uh, you know, for her to have jurisdiction in the upper court, she'd have to have the file. I don't know, but remember way back in the beginning, the very first thing they did is talk about a guardianship file. The judicial assistant had it. So you have a right. Okay, thank you. This matter is concluded. Mr. Forshag, so this matter is concluded. It's done, right? They're done right there. This matter is concluded. Anything now is just talk. Mr. Forshag is talking now. Your Honor, we had just one further issue we'd like to take up today, and that is a petition from the plaintiff related to the UCC filing and the proposed order asking the Wisconsin Department of Financial Institutions to sponge financing statement filed 28th, 29th. The court? Okay. I will expunge those as well. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Court, thank you. Ms. Wilson, I object. Court, and appeal. And I appeal. Court, that you may do, ma'am. Thank you. Court, but you got to figure out the process for appeal. Thank you, Your Honor. Court, thank you. Right? So it's a process of appeal. So we don't have, it's not a question of law, it's a question of process. We need somebody to tell us what's the procedure to appeal. It's not legal advice. Uh, the court, thank you. Mr. Forshag, have a good day. Clerk, what was the date on those? Court, oh, just a second. Mr. Forshag, the date of those filings? Mr. Forshag, it's restated in the proposed order. Mr. F the clerk, okay. Mr. Forshag, May 28th. The court, would you like someone to walk you out? Mr. Forshag, I'll be okay. The court, okay. The court, would you like somebody to walk you out? Why, didn't he look good? Mr. Forshag, I'll be okay. So somewhere in this blah, 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 although it's not in here, when they were done or almost done, Terry walked up behind Mr. Forshag 
And he turned around and she pointed her finger at him and said, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. Good for her. And the guy got kind of shaky. He didn't look good. I don't remember her exact thing, but I know it was rebuking. I believe it was in the name of the Lord. She may have said it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Good for you. Mr. Forshag, it's time. It's not the first time, unfortunately. Okay, just checking, Mr. Forshag. It's not the first time, unfortunately. Whatever that means. Mr. Court, no. Mr. Forshag, but thank you. May 28th, 29th, the clerk. Okay, thank you. Court, thank you. Forshag, thank you, Your Honor. Wilson, I need proof, buddy. I need proof. I need a transcript from today. Court, ma'am. If you're going to be filing, you can make a request of the court reporter of the transcript. It doesn't automatically happen. Although you're supposed to file a copy. But since it doesn't automatically happen, we'll do it for you. I can't tell you how to go about filing your request for an appeal. But you do have a right to do that. And there's going to be a payment associated with the transcript. So you will have to make arrangements with that. Take care of that, okay? Ms. Wilson, that's fine. Court. So we've got other court that we have to do right now. So if you want to make a request, you can call in and make requests of the court reporter. Ms. Wilson, thank you. I, Jennifer Claren, district court record, reporter. Who is she? District court. Where are we supposed to be? Circuit court. District Court Reporter for Rock County, Wisconsin, to hereby certify that I reported the foregoing proceedings on August 3rd, 2018, and that the transcript annexed hereto is a full, true, and correct transcription of my stenographic notes reduced to typewritten form, dated August 13th, 2018, electrically signed by Jennifer Claren. Jennifer Claren. RPR, District Court Reporter, not Circuit Court, Rock County Courthouse. Where's the Circuit Court Reporter at the Rock County Courthouse? That's who we needed. Well, we got our phone number. We can put that in into Dunn's. That's always good to do. Any phone number you have, put into Dunn's under Dunn's number, sir, to see what comes up. All sorts of crazy shit does. I put in my court's phone number for the 63rd District Court, and it comes up. Kent, comma, County of, parentheses, Incorporated, INC. Crazy. So as you can see, right, if we're to say when did court end, it's when the judge said the court ends. That was way up here. This matter is concluded. I like that. I'm even going to change the color. This matter is concluded. Case was over. And they did all this other stuff. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Talking about what they were going to do with the filings in the state. But they're still here. And again, things that had happened today that had not been there. Because when I looked earlier today, the last thing put in was this transcript. From motion hearing held 8-3-18. Hey, I just read it to you. In front of Judge McCrory. There she is. 8-14, affidavit of mailing. Notice of entry of judgment mailed to Terry Wilson. Not Terry Lynn Wilson. Not using her full legal name. Notice of entry of judgment, cover letter, and notice of entry and judgment, affidavit of mailing file. Well, where's the cover letter for notice of entry of judgment? So we'll have to see if that comes. So that's where we are today. Um, you know, again, when Terry went to court, she's supposed to be going up to the fourth floor. It's just stuff that you're going to have to pay attention to when you deal with these Right, they're just fork tongue liars. They keep, everything they do is they lie, they cheat, they steal. They're right where they need to be. God has them all right where they need to be. All the liars, cheaters, and stealers that just can't do anything but do that have become attorneys. 
right? So we have them all in one place. Now we can just, you know, cast them out of the freaking uh, Christian nation and not put up with them anymore. So notice a hearing. Case number 2018, CV000136. Rock County Circuit Court. Courtroom D, fourth floor, north courtroom. But when Terry went up there, there was nobody there. So I told her, well, Terry, you need to take your paperwork then that you've already filed. It's got file numbers on it. Next time you're in town, go to the fourth floor and find somebody and say, hey, I was supposed to have been here and I got this runaround and you want to file that stuff into the court. But if we can believe what, you know, what this says, that this is the 2018 CV000136 Ditech Financial LLC versus Terry L. Wilson at L. case. Well, then the transcripts have been put in there. But, you know, Terry won't be back for two weeks. So we're going to have to wait a while unless you can get a friend to go run down and look at this stuff. So that's why I wanted to talk about this now and say, well, that's as far as I can take it. Um, they said they were going to do things. You can search yourself. The UCC filings are still there. Court case is still here. <laughs> it says that it's closed. I have to laugh. Closed. But that's for electronic filing, apparently. Because we're still putting paperwork in. So it ain't closed. They're still taking it. Very interesting. Okay. I'm going to have to leave it there. I think I covered all the particulars. So... Okay, uh, that's what I wanted to show today, and tomorrow I hope to do a video on these other things I was talking about, like the ID for the natural person, and the uh, things I did for my artificial person with the Department of Treasury, the things to do with uh, us not being registered by Select the Service, which is just huge, that's like monumentally huge. Just to cover those again real quick, right, we got to think of the Military Select the Service Act. That has to do with the draft. This isn't anything to do with volunteering. So if you volunteered you didn't and didn't do this, you didn't do this. There's nothing you can say about it. It doesn't matter that you volunteered. You didn't comply with the act of every able-bodied man to be um, registered, classified, and examined for the draft. Shall, as soon as practically possible, following his registration, be so classified and examined. That's just huge. So we're going to get these people to tell us where to go. Get into the book so that you show up in the United States having done your civic duty and your civic rights will be returned to you. And you don't have to run away from the United States. No, that's not the answer. The answer is we need to be here. They don't have us in the United States right now. They have us in the United States of America. King George's venue. We need to get in the United States. And even there, in his venue, where there is bond service. We don't have any rights. Right? We're not showing up in the United States anywhere. They don't, if you send a letter, they don't use a black postmark with a five-digit zip code to cancel the stamp. Now, we're trying to take care of that, too. That's something Bobby's working on, and we'll, we'll see what we got with that here tomorrow also. But uh, I'm going to leave it there. And again, if you can, hey, that's my address. If you could send me a dollar or two or a check or you want to put it in PayPal, there's my PayPal account. If you want to do it by PayPal and want to use your credit card, well, I can send you a payment request. I just need your email address and the amount that you would like to donate. Because it's the 14th of uh, August, and I have $100 to my name. I kid you not. So please help. Okay, we'll talk to you all later. Amen.